Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy that I've come to this meeting. I've really had a great time. It's so well organized, and I can see all young people interacting and giving talks. Wonderful meeting, and hopefully the last session will be good, and you guys can rest afterwards. Anyway, uh, as Sabine said, thank you for your introduction. I'm from the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how we do structural analysis in my lab uh, on different areas of glycoconjugates. Um, this picture actually is a picture of um, spike protein and the ACE2, but uh, I like it so much that I'm using it, but I'm not going to talk about um, uh, COVID today, but uh, we have uh, um, uh, done extensive work in the last two years on um, spike protein and ACE, ACE2, so you can read about it. But today I'm just going to give you some examples of some of the work we've done in the last six, seven months on a couple of our projects. So my lab does structural characterization of glycoconjugates as a whole. So we can start with glycosaminoglycans, we start with tissues or cells, we do structural characterization of glycosaminoglycans uh, using mass spec and NMR. Uh, we do ex extensive amount of glycolipid analysis, uh, a lot of bacterial polysaccharide work, lipopolysaccharide, capsular polysaccharide, and uh, EPS polysaccharides. We do a lot of glycoprotein work from cells or tissues, uh, viruses, um, including the SARS-CoV-2, uh, a lot of fungal glucan work, uh, and basically we use, we have a bag of tools that we use depending on what is needed. We use mass spec, GCMS, um, HPLC, um, mold EMS, electrospray, extensive amount, amount of NMR characterization, 1D and 2D NMR characterization, linkage, compositions, molecular weight determinations, uh, capillary electrophoresis. It really depends what the project needs and we will we'll use, we'll use it as needed. So, but for today's talk, I'm only going to concentrate on glycoproteins and I'm going to concentrate um, on that side of the, um, the slide, basically. Uh, everything um, on that side is what we, I'm going to show today. So basically, I'll cover glycomics. Um, and at a later stage, maybe next year, I'll come back and tell you about our glycoproteomics efforts and what we're trying to do for enriching for glycoproteins and glycopeptides prior to analysis. But for glycan analysis, we can start from tissues or cells um, or singly purified glycoproteins. And the way we usually do it, we, we do a reduction carboxymethylation of the protein and then um, protease digestion, depending on the sequence of the protein, we may do trypsin or we may do multiple um, digestions of the protein, and we can release the N-glycans with a combination of either N-glycanase, uh, PNGase F, or PNGase F and A, depending on uh, what the glycans, proposed glycans are going to be. Uh, there's various techniques that we can use for uh, their analysis. Predominantly in my lab, we permethylate glycans prior to analysis. Uh, we also do, can do labeling of the glycans uh, and then do HPLC or LCMS, but as it may come clear a little bit later, uh, we predominantly permethylate, basically replacing all the meth hydroxyl groups with methyl groups in order to increase sensitivity for the glycans and also enable us to do detailed structural analysis, sequencing of the glycans, looking at the non-reducing end versus non-reducing end, and the moieties attached to different sides of the molecule. And then we can, uh, we'll do mass spec analysis, depending whether it's N-linked or O-linked, and in O-linked, uh, again, uh, we can use beta elimination to release the uh, glycans or hydrazinolysis sometimes. So I'm just going to go through a few examples, uh, as I said, in the last uh, uh, few months that we've done. So uh, basically, uh, this is an example of collaboration with uh, uh, Hudson Fries and his uh, postdoc Polina uh, from Stanford Children's Health uh, uh, Research Center. Uh, Hud is interested in looking at how fucose is um, Basically, what happens to fucose in the cells? Where is it coming from? He, well, his question was, he was interested to know, the pool of fucose that we have, this homogeneous pool of fucose that we have in the cells, is it just one big bag of fucose being used for different 
uh, glycosylation pathways because we can have fucose coming from uh, ex exogenous fucose from diet. We can have from salvage pathway. That means it's already been in there. We're going to basically get it from what was already in the cells, right? Salvage pathway. Or we can do, the cells can do de novo sequencing, uh, de novo synthesis of these using um, either glucose or mannose, for example. So is there one big bag of all these going into one pool and they go to difference? Or is there a difference where the fucose ends up depending on how it starts, how it gets to the cells? So what they've done is they basically treated the cells, various cells actually, number of cells they've done, uh, with C13 um, fucose and wanted to track where it's going in the cells. So the first spectra you see up there is different amount of these C13 fucose starting from zero micromolar to 50 micromolar. And we can see this is just a snapshot of one glycan seeing how the ratios change as the external amount of fucose increases, the C13 amount increases what happens to the molecule, to the end-linked glycan. So what we can see is at the beginning, it's only C12. And as we increase the amount of uh, uh, C13, we can get complete C13, basically. So at about 15, um, 15 micromolar, we get equal amount of C12 to C13. So um, the other experiments that was done was looking at um, the, the original uh, GDP glucose. How, it, how is that produced, and what is the amount of that in the cells? Correlating the amount of that with the amount of any glycans that are present, uh, they were able to deduce and uh, where, what is the ratio of the fucose uh, from exogenous fucose versus what is coming from uh, endogenous fucose. So looking at the fragmentation, we were able to do MSMS analysis to figure out where the fucose is going to. So when you feed these cells with C13 fucose, the exogenous fucose predominantly goes to the, for, for, to the core. So the first place it goes to is the core. And then after that, if there is enough of the C13, then it starts going to the antenna. So, but if you have very limited amount of exogenous fucose coming in the lab, it only goes into the core. So, and then from the MSMS, we can kind of calculate the ratios of what is the amount going to the antenna versus going to the core. So why is that important? Why is he interested in that? Because exogenous amount of these um, monosaccharides can be used for therapeutic purposes, right? Fucose, mannose, galactose, these have been used, for example, for CDG disease-related um, studies. It's been used in cancer that they feed um, animals, and they've done clinical studies feeding these monosaccharides, and they've seen changes in outcome of the disease, especially for CDG outcomes. So it's important to find out these ratios and where is that exogenous monosaccharide going into the, uh, to the cells, where is that ending up? So that was uh, recently published in Journal of Cell Biology. You can look at the more details. It's an extensive study. They did a lot of work. Uh, we just did, did limited amount of work on figuring out exactly the location that the fucose is going to. Uh, this is another study with um, Dr. Lee. This is from universities, uh, Georgia State University. He's making an array of oligosaccharides. We've been talking about having standards for a lot of our experiments. The one limiting factor in glycobiology is having the right standards for doing the work that you guys are doing and we are doing. So he's tapped into being able to do chemoenzymatic synthesis of oligosaccharides. And he needed to confirm the structure to make sure that he's, he's making the correct structure. So using MSMS, uh, by going into MS3, we were able to um, basically confirm that the structure has a bisecting gluconac, and uh, so this can be used by researchers at building a library and uh, maybe extending the uh, bisecting gluconac and seeing able to see whether we've, he's been able to successfully extend the bi bisecting gluconac 
for that being used for external users as standards. So that has recently been also published. So another interesting study is, again, something recent we've gone into with Dr. Miller from University of Illinois. He was interested in to see how the sperm gets, uh, gets into the um, female tract and how is the immune system, female's immune system, not um, basically rejecting uh, the sperm. So um, Andel, um, in 2007, had done a glycosylation study of sperms in humans. And at the time, she had figured out that uh, Lewis structures were present in the sperm. And they postulated then that these Lewis structures could be responsible for the fact that um, basically the sperm can now uh, be able to get into the tract and not be blocked by uh, the female um, immune system. So uh, Dr. Miller wanted to confirm this in porcine samples and see whether there's any additional factors, additional functional groups could be responsible for this. So we looked at the mass spec of N-glycans released from the sperm uh, in porcine samples. And that is the full mass spec spectrum. We were able to see uh, Lewis structures present in very small amount. The spectrum you see at the top is the extended version of the high molecular weight mass regions. And we see tiny amount, maybe few percent of Lewis structures. So Lewis structures are not significant portion in porcine. Uh, and, but bisecting gluconac was present significantly. So one feature that we saw in porcine is bisecting. So they also found bisecting um, in, in um, 2007. So definitely bisecting is postulated that bisecting and uh, Lewis structures may be responsible for this. But they had also detected Siglac structures in the track. And they wanted to know whether salic acid could also be playing a role in here. So we looked at the linkages of um, salic acids present um, in the O-linked. We did not detect any salic acid in the N-linked. They were expecting some N-linked, but we did not detect any um, basic sal salilation in the N-linked. But the salilation was present in the O-linked. And interestingly, we did MSMS and we went to the MS5 in order to be able to do linkage analysis using permethylation and be able to distinguish between 2.3 and 2.6 and the ratio of the 2.3 to 2.6. And we found that the salic acid uh, was determined to be a mixture of 2.3 and 2.6, but mainly 2.3 linked salic acids. So um, it is believed that Siglac are playing a part in here because of salic acids. So maybe salic acid, combination of salic acids, Lewis structures, um, and the bisecting gluconax could be playing a role here. So another study uh, is collaboration with Nicholas Heaton from Duke University. So he's studying influenza uh, a and influenza B virus, and trying to figure out a host system that could block um, the virus attaching to the cells, a host kind of antiviral um, uh, therapy. So what he had done, they had done a, um, a, a YGY study uh, using CRISPR, and they had figured out that against influenza B. Uh, so they wanted to see basically what is popping up when they um, do a GWAS study against influenza B. What they found out was uh, there is the uh, beta-1-3 gluc A transferase that is the only thing that was popping up. So this gluc A transferase was the only thing that they showed that is, um, was unusual when they, 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 they did the GWAS studies. They wanted to know what is the outcome of these um, GLUK transferase, 1, 3 GLUK transferase. So they wanted to see whether having overexpression of these um, GLUK transferase has any effect on 
glycosylation and link glycosylation um, at all or not. So when they did some lectin staining and then we did the glycan analysis, we found out that the silic acids are uh, being replaced by glue K in the end link glycans. So basically, it's out-competing, the glue K is out-competing with the silic acids. And when you look at the, um, the way it's being made in the Golgi, um, actually, um, the silyl transferases are at the end, end of the process where the glycans are being processed, whereas the glue K is present first. So they get added first, and then glycosol trans glue Salal trans transferases come later. So basically, it's replacing, the glue K is replacing the silic acids. So that's why um, it's basically blocking the influenza B being, um, 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 being attached to silic acid because there is no silic acids. So that is being blocked. So they're going to possibly use this as tapping into this as an antiviral, potential antiviral activity for all types of influenza that have silic acids uh, that they basically um, attach to silic acids. So interestingly, that spectra um, is the normal spectra uh, from the wild type and the one that you see that is extended uh, uh, with very little silic acids um, is the one that have glue K attached to um, the end link glycans. Interestingly, um, there is a diagnostic mass that we see associated with the glue K containing um, oligosaccharides. They lose a 32 mass unit that because of permethylation, we can use this as a diagnostic mass to see that um, because you get a beta elimination of the uronic acid, uh, um, you see this diagnostic mass, so we can use that as a diagnostic. So Basically, with a drastic reduction in silic acid moieties on the angling glycans, influenza infection was drastically inhibited. And then we confirmed that with uh, just running a labeling the glycans and running that by HPLC and confirming that by mass spec also. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that beta elimination is not interfering with any of the uh, assignments. So we did label and run the glucans, uh, the, the glycans, and did MSMS to confirm those. And also confirm the linkage of the remaining salic acid. There was residual amount of salic acid left after the introduction of the glue K into the N-linked pathway. And interestingly, uh, the results indicate that the alpha 2,3 salic acid linkage is marginally less abundant than the 2,6 from the remaining salic acids that are still there. So um, these are just a couple of the projects that we've done in the last um, six or seven months uh, on various um, N-link glycosylation studies and O-link glycosylation studies. But what I'm excited about is being able to, moving forward, we're going to use, uh, we're going to use FAMES. This is a, uh, a modification of an ion mobility um, instrument, is an addition to the existing instrument. Basically, it's an add-on, it's, uh, it's an orthogonal method to uh, LCMS, so you can do uh, LC and also use this ion mobility to guide ions. So I'm interested to use this for a lot of glycopeptide analysis and glycans to see how it separates and how it will uh, help us separate some of these um, moieties, some of these isomers from each other. So basically what it does, it funnels in different structures. Uh, so you can start from uh, um, basically giving it different uh, voltages and you can filter silic acids, you can filter hex -nax, uh, filter hex nax and silic acids, then different structures will pop up, so you get a different layer of separation in, the, in addition to LC. Um, because LC on its own um, may, may have limitations of just um, isomers coming out together, so if this is added on, maybe we can uh, separate those isomers from each other. I think it's very powerful for glycopeptide analysis. I want to tell you about, we mentioned the courses from the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center yesterday. 
So uh, for the last 30 years, we've done um, hands-on training courses in carbohydrate analysis. Um, the last two years, they were virtual, but this year, again, uh, they were in hands-on. So we will have them both virtual and hands-on um, in the future. Uh, the virtual one will be shorter, of course. Uh, these are hands-on courses. The first one is a polysaccharide course. So basically, you learn about composition analysis, linkage analysis. Um, you have a module of NMR, molecular modeling, or mass spec. Um, basically, it's mostly on polysaccharide work. The second course is probably our most popular course, uh, is release of N-linked and only glycans, mass spec analysis, HPAC analysis, and NMR mass spec and molecular modeling of glycoproteins and glycolipids. The third one is glycosaminoglycans, doing a lot of disaccharide analysis by um, SACS HPLC, by mass spec and NMR studies. The fourth one this year, for some reason, was very popular because bioinformatics of glycoproteins, so a lot of glycoproteomics analysis, data analysis, looking at different softwares that are available for uh, glycan analysis and glycoproteomics analysis. This is just for glycoproteins. Uh, so we don't cover any other uh, glycoconjugates in this course. Um, they're mostly in August, and the last course is in October. And with conclusion, I'd just like to thank our glycomics group. These are the folks which predominantly just do glycomics and glycoproteomics, and our collaborators. And uh, we are fortunate with the funding because these, the funding from NIH, from uh, Glycomip and DOE enables us to do these collaborations at, at no charge to other people. I'll be happy to take any questions.